Well, uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm just going to get started here. Um, our first speaker is Jason Hill from Vermont Center of Eco Studies, and they will be prevent presenting uh, Staying Relevant, a cooperatively designed online database to house natural resource survey data collected by citizen scientists. Thank you, everybody. And All right, thank you very much. So um, this is a cooperatively designed online database that the folks here at FEMC and I designed last year to replace an aging database uh, system. And we're going to kind of walk you through it. I think most of us are well aware that the idea of community or citizen science has been growing essentially exponentially in terms of the number of publications that have peer-reviewed uh, peer-reviewed publications that have used citizen science data as well as the number of actual citizen science projects are growing through the roof and definitely part of that 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 rise in use of course is the realization of scientists that citizens represent a let's say voluntary or free source of data collection and sometimes even financing for projects there at this point is a project to do almost anything you want from collecting the most intimate details of your reproductive cycle reproductive cycles and love life to walking around like I do with this NASA app that records the geomagnosphere around me and see how buildings deflect the signal and stuff uh, to taking photographs of wildlife, right? Um, to identifying shapes of quasars out in space. The thing is there is a lot of competition. As someone who manages a citizen science project, I get comments from our citizen scientists about how to improve what we do based on the other projects that those same citizen scientists have been involved in. Even if they don't tell you to your face, um, as someone who's involved in multiple levels of citizen science, there's of course competition for people's time. People choose between your project and other projects and there is a need to stay relevant um, and a need, to, um, a need to provide seamless tools, especially for this younger generation of folks growing up. Um, they're going to have a much higher expectation for the technological, um, inter, um, for weaving technology into the citizen science project than a lot of the senior, a lot of the citizen scientists do now, which tend to be, for natural resource collection, tend to be older, whiter, wealthier, and more educated than the general public. But one of the, I think, best examples of that, I think many of you are familiar with, that I'm involved with, is iNaturalist. It's an incredibly simple um, uh, an app and website that's seamless. It does everything you'd want in a citizen science project. It's social, it's interactive. Almost anyone of any participation skill can participate. You upload photos, you interact with community members, and an artificial intelligence algorithm helps you to identify the, the, um, the, the subject in your photograph. Terrific. Of course, they have literally teams of dozens of programmers who are behind the scenes. This project is backed by now National Geographic, but was started by the California Academy of Natural Sciences. This grew out of a master's project um, in 2008 in California. Um, there's over a million users for iNaturalist now. This is what people are becoming to expect in citizen science projects. Um, now, I'm not saying that you can't be successful with far less sophisticated tools, uh, because that's what we have. And I'm not saying you can't be competitive. If you have marginally working tools and marginally working materials, but what I'm saying is that you do not want to get in the way of your the enthusiasm of your volunteers. Um, there is competition taking place. And people do switch projects. Even on our project, we have 20 to 25 percent turnover from year to year. Substantial amount of resources go into training and recruiting new subjects. If we could figure out ways to lower our turnover rate to keep our volunteers in greater numbers, that would free me up to do more time for data analysis and for expansion. So it isn't simply about keeping up with the Joneses by in improving the visualization or the, the products that you offer your citizen scientists. It's about being competitive and ultimately freeing up time for me to focus on the, th the big picture stuff. Um, so and with that idea, I'll just briefly introduce you to Mountain Birdwatch. It's this citizen science project that I coordinate now that began in the year 2000. Um, every year since 2000, hundreds of citizen scientists adopt a route in the spruce fir zone of the Northeast United States and they hike in the day before, they camp out overnight, 
3.30 the next morning, they get up and they visit fixed sampling stations. There's about 750 sampling stations on these 125 routes across the Northeast. Um, again, these are spruce fir zones, so just below the Alpine. Um, and they do repeated point counts at each one of those sampling stations for only 10 species of birds. I think that's pretty critical. That lowers the entry to participation. It's not quite like iNaturalist where anybody, or eBird, um, anybody can participate. There is some training, but 10 species is manageable for even someone who's just moderately interested in birds to be able to learn. We're talking about like Bicknell thrush and yellow-bellied flycatcher and black pole warbler, um, species like that up there. So observers adopt a route and it's, it's asking a lot of people. It's one day a year, any day in June, but they hike in the night before and do repeated counts the next morning. It's basically two days of their time, essentially. Um, here are the 125 survey routes with the 750 approximate sampling stations. And initially, of course, we targeted birders and hikers, people who are already enthusiastic about these activities to begin with. Subsequently, we expanded our reach out into snowmobile clubs, equestrian clubs, people who just like to be outdoors. And again, it's only 10 species, so, you know, it's entirely doable. Um, I think the probably especially after the talks this morning you realize why we might be interested in monitoring birds in the spruce fir forest one because a lot of those species are routinely missed from your classic roadside surveys um, but also under all of the projections the spruce fir zone is expected to greatly diminish over the next 200 years uh, to less than half of its extent now as our climate becomes progressively warmer here um, in new england um, many of these species that we monitor are only found in spruce fir forest. So as the spruce fir forest zone shrinks by greater than 50% and moves to northern latitudes, of course those populations, my a priori hypothesis would be that they're going to become smaller as well. Um, we, all of our data are open access to our volunteers and to all citizen scientists. We, we publish them on KNB um, and I uh, put them in eBird each year and anybody can download and interact with our data. and. Um, I analyze those data each year. Um, we use some pretty sophisticated uh, analytical tools to analyze these data and to publish with them. And we provide results of trends for all those species on our website. Just a couple of ideas. We recently published a popu population-wide estimate for Bicknell's thrush with these data. Uh, as you see over here, darker areas mean greater, relative, greater actual abundance of Bicknell's thrush. And I'm working with a grad student right now um, to look at potential areas of conflict between high areas, uh, areas of relatively high black pole warbler density and uh, potential wind energy infrastructure. So we, we do a lot of things with these data. And quite frankly, our existing online data portry, portal, which looks something like this, did not, did not visually meet the sophistication of the entire rest of the project. Um, for me, as a quantitative person, that would certainly give me pause. If I spend all this effort collecting data for this project, do they actually get used for something? Or does this go right into a paper filing cabinet somewhere? Um, and they burn it once a year out in the parking lot or something. Like, um, this doesn't inspire confidence to me. But more so, the, our old database was written in a proprietary language. Um, it could only be accessed by the programmer. And at times, he would even lose access with the database. Like One guy that could actually get our data couldn't get it back, was kept on a server in Quebec. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't a great setup, but it was what we had. Um, since 2010, we've, our volunteers have done over 20,000 point counts. Our database has grown to such a point that even retrieving data from it became arduous and just clogged the system. The database was never designed to handle that kind of traffic, those kind of record retrievals. So working with the folks here at FEMC, especially Mike Finnegan, who is a terrific programmer, we made this through a series of collaborative meetings sitting down. What would you like to see in an online data portal? And I want to stress this. This is a data portal. This is not the database. The database looks something entirely different than this. You don't want your citizen scientists to interact with the database. That's for us. They work with this pretty shiny um, web application that, that that houses their information for, that takes in their information for them. I speak two computer languages, but I don't speak P PHP or MySQL or JavaScript, which is the three languages that go into this database man uh, creation. And the key is, instead of using all my resources over the next year to learn how to do this, 
I partnered with people that already do this and do it extremely well and extremely professional, professionally. Um, a, a user comes to the site and this is what they see. They log in, they have a personal profile, they can upload their photo, make the site look a little more personal. They're only limited access to sites that they have, uh, the, the data they have. They, they only can see the data that I've given them permission to. So they can't accidentally log into uh, change information for another route, of course. And they also see all their past data that's been collected since 2000 in their account. Um, maybe that's a little hard to see with the contrast for you guys, but basically we collect information about their effort. We use this for grant purposes, of course. Um, and in the past, the, you know, we collect several thousand point counts a year from our observers. And people tend to, citizen scientists, tend to write a ton of comments. Not necessarily comments reflecting um, information that you would want it to incorporate into your analysis. It's things like, oh, a raven flew over and it was being chased by a red-tailed hawk. And then this crow came in and it was like, get out of here, raven. And, and so we'd have thousands of comments that potentially could affect how we might interpret that data. What if an observer wrote down, I'm not sure I heard Bicknell's thrush. It may have been Swainson's. But if you have thousands of comment fields to search through, it became arduous, almost impossible for us to do that. So now we have a smart system where we ask observers to fl uh, flag problems they encountered on the route. And if they like access problems, uh, the trail was washed out, which happens in these mountainous areas. And when they do the point counts, we ask them to flag problems as well. And they still have a comment field. They can talk about whatever they want, and they do. But that is a shortcut for us to uh, immediately identify routes that have, that have problems um, that need to be looked at. So they, you wouldn't, they would see, um, the, this is the six sampling stations for this route. They would click on one and enter it. The database is smart. So you enter the date one time and never ask you for the date. It assumes all the other point counts were conducted on the same date. You can change that date, but then you're forced to provide a comment why you changed it. The point counts are five minutes back to back. You enter the time once. The next times are filled in for you plus every five minutes. You can change it, but you have to make a comment. Um, you identify the species you see, and then on the next page you enter the point count totals for the four or five minute point counts. And so this minimizes the number of, of rows that would not have any data entered into it. So it minimizes the number of data entry mistakes by minimizing the number of spaces people can accidentally, you know, be trying to type data for Swainson's but accidentally type it on Hermit Thrush row, for example. Tons of simple air checking um, and formatting that goes in to prevent hundreds of mistakes from being made, um, which is key. Um, and they, observers then basically check their own data, and then we have a data verification process itself. Now, in the future, what we're looking for, um, we're going to be talking with uh, Mike Finnegan in January, adding pop-up video support to each page. I don't know what to do here. There's a video of me that pops up. And these are the route documents that observers get. We're going to be making these live and linkable so people can directly edit them as well, suggest edits. So right now they send us in a, a, you know, a suggestion for um, an, uh, the description to how to find one of the sampling stations. They'll send that in to me and I send it to my interns and the interns edit the website and send it back to them. Does this look right? So in the future we'll have the ability for them to suggest edits via Google Doc system directly to the route documents and the maps and upload improved photos as well. Um, so really taking the burden off of us for man micromanaging these documents and putting as much as the observer wants to put it into their hands. Um, yeah, so moving forward, Mountain Mike, um, folks at FEMC, Jim Duncan and I were part of a highly competitive but ultimately unsuccessful NSF grant last year. And we have some ideas about incorporating insect monitoring, the things that these birds eat up there, as well as atmospheric air pollution into mountain bird watch monitoring. The database is designed to be seamlessly expanded. Unlike our previous system, a lot of databases you'll find if you dig under the, the hood are built in layers. And you get in the future and you want to grow laterally, changing one of those layers means changing all the other layers above it and can mean basically reprogramming the entire database from that level upwards. It's hugely problematic. Uh, the database we have is a parallel built system, and I should also say it's redundantly backed up physically off-site as well, so we don't have to worry about losing our data. Um, but it's built for expansion. 
So in the next couple years, if we're funded to add an insect sampling component to Mountain Bird Watch, that will seamlessly be integrated for those volunteers who count birds and count bugs. Um, they'll see those questions woven together. For those individuals who only count the insects, they'll only see those questions about insects. So I'm very excited for that. And if you're interested in talking more about this or the NSF application we have going in October, um, be happy to talk to you about this. And that's it. Thank you very much. I meant to say also that it looks really simple, right? Like big deal. That's what you're thinking, like big deal. And that, that's exactly the point. It, it does look really simple. It's, it's meant to. Three, five minutes for questions. Okay, thanks, Brian. Yes, question, thanks, buddy. <laughs> Curious if you had done anything you talked about, so you're using uh, like people are um, interacting with the database and then um, you know doing analysis on it. Have yeah. you experimented at all with um, sort of like presenting queries from the database? In yes. Formats? Yeah. So I'll, this year I'll build I'll be building some R Shiny tools that allow observers to interact with and just download and visualize like their just their route data or their state's data. Um, I should also say the data are automatically downloaded in a format that I use directly in JEGS for analysis, which is really nice. The database also automatically uploads all of our observations each year to eBird in a format that goes through the back door of eBird and deposits the data without us like manually uploading the data um, to make the data even more, more readily available. So anyway, yeah, which yeah, might Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering, so did you have um, baseline data prior to wind farm development and then wind farm development happened? That's exactly right. We have the Mountain Bird Watch program um, uh, goes back to the year 2000. And it's the same routes that are surveyed annually, 750 locations. So, yeah. And has that study, for instance, or other studies done, have they uh, been consulted or uh, been influential? Yes. Yeah, Green Mountain National Forest and White Mountains have also used Mountain Bird Watch data prior, um, a separate previous beforehand, um, have used Mountain Bird Watch data to appropriately place wind tower sites. Um, yeah, also for dictating management zones in Green Mountain National Forest, they've been used for a lot of purposes. Yeah. So in that case, so they're taking into account wind bird information and not just typically. That's right. They're taking into account detection, corrected abundance of these breeding birds. That's right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, guys. Yeah.